Hi, my name is Avril Sorter, and you're listening to Conducting Cisco Unified Wireless Site Survey. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about how to select a survey model. And the way you want to think about this is that you have been collecting all of your customer information by using that customer questionnaire. And now you've got that information, you need to decide what kind of model are you going to go out and do the site survey for. And those are the models we're going to talk about in this lesson. What we're going to do is we're going to spend some time to stepping through each of those survey models, starting with the data only wireless LAN and going to a high density deployment. We've got lots of people, lots of transmissions, lots of high throughput going on. Then we're going to talk about voice over wireless LAN. Then we're going to talk about location aware and that is when you're using the Wi-Fi RFID tagging. Then we'll talk about using wireless LANs for bridges and mesh networks. And then we're going to finish up with a demonstration. In the demonstration, I'm going to use the Cisco Expert tool to look at the receive signal strength and why that's relevant to this lesson should become apparent as I go through and explain each of the different survey models. So let's start talking about those different survey models. So the first thing I want to talk about is the fact that your data rate changes as you move around in the cell. So back in the good old days when we had just 802.11b, if I was close to the access point and in good RF conditions, I would have been able to get 11 megabits per second. And then as I moved away from the access point into more difficult RF environments, my data rate would have dropped. And out on the edge of the cell, I'd have been down to 1 megabit per second. Now, to get 11 megabits per second, if I was in an open environment, let's say a manufacturing floor or outside, I might have been able to be as far away as 80 to 100 feet and still get 11 megabits per second. But if I wanted to get out further from the access point, let's say three, 350 feet, then my data rate would have dropped to one megabit per second. And so if my customer wanted wireless data and they said to me, yes, one megabit per second everywhere, that's just fine, then I would be able to deploy access points that are far further apart because my cell radius could be three, 350 feet before that user would need to hand over to another access point. Whereas if they said to me, Avril, I need 11 megabits per second everywhere, then my cell radius would have been just 100 feet or, or less before they needed to hand off to another access point. And so I would have had to have deployed six times more access points than I would have done if they just wanted one megabit per second. So it's really important to understand what kind of services that they want, what kind of data rates are they are expecting. So let's say you went into an environment where the customer says, I'm just using laptops and only data applications. And in that environment, you can afford to let that laptop go down to the lower data rates before it hands over to the next access point because those applications aren't sensitive to delay. And so for data only type applications, Cisco recommends that you have about a 10 to 15 percent overlap between cells. And sometimes you can actually get away with less than that, although Cisco does recommend the 10 to 15 percent cell overlap. So people say to me, Avril, what do you mean by cell overlap? So here in this diagram, you can see that I'm talking about the coverage between two access points overlapping between 10 and 15 percent when you have a data only wireless LAN. Now, earlier I was talking about the range when you're talking about 802.11b. Most people today are deploying and upgrading to 802.11n. 
with 8 or 2 or 11 n in a normal kind of office environment with some walls and some cubes you'd normally expect 8 or 2 or 11 n to give you a range of somewhere between 120 and 150 feet but again it does depend on what kind of walls you've got between the access point and the client and it also of course depends on the frequency because if you're operating in the 5 gigahertz band the signals will attenuate more so the range will be less so the second survey model that I want to take you through is the high density wireless LAN. And this is when you've got a lot of users all talking to the same access point. Now a lot of people don't realize that the cell capacity is actually about 50% less than your actual average data rate. Let me explain that. In a wireless cell, when the user goes to transmit a data frame, the first thing it does is they listen. And if there's nothing transmitting, then they go ahead and transmit. So a lot of the time, you're not actually transmitting, but you're listening. And so if your average user data rate is 20 megabits per second, your actual throughput can be as low as 10 megabits per second. So imagine then, if you would, you've got 20 users all talking to the same access point and their average data rate is 20 megabits per second. Their average throughput is 10 megabits per second, which means if there's 20 users, they're actually getting half a megabit per second each. And so sometimes those data rates can be a little bit disappointing for the customer and they say, no, 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 I need to have higher data rates. And the way you resolve that problem is to deploy more access points so there's less uses per access point. So there are two ways to decrease the coverage of an access point. The first is to increase the minimum data rate and the second is to reduce the transmit power of the access point. In this slide we're looking at the first option increasing the minimum data rate and the way you do that is you go into the access point and you configure it such that it says don't let any clients communicate unless they are transmitting at least at this data rate. So in this slide example I'm saying a minimum data rate of 50 megabits per second. What that means is a client that's further away, that could have communicated, let's say at 20 megabits per second, now knows that it can no longer associate it with that access point, and so therefore will not be under coverage of that access point. Now the problem with this approach is that when I shrink the cell coverage, then I'm shrinking the distance between two access points. And if I have two access points that are operating on the same frequency, then they're going to interfere more with each other because they're physically closer. Now, that's referred to as co-channel interference, interference between two access points operating on the same channel. Now, if I'm operating in the 2.4 gigahertz band, I only have three non-overlapping cells. So in North America, that would be channel 1, 6, and 11. So two access points that are both operating on channel 1 are going to be quite close together. And for this reason, if you're deploying a high density wireless LAN, we recommend that you move to the 5 gigahertz band. And the reason is in the 5 gigahertz band, you have a lot more channels available to you. So you can deploy, for instance, on maybe channel 36, channel 40, channel 44, channel 48, etc. And therefore, your access points that, for instance, are both being deployed on channel 36 are going to be further away, simply because you have more channels to choose from. So again, recommendation is whenever you're looking at a high-density deployment, because of the co-channel interference, that you look at deploying in the 5 gigahertz band. So the second option that I have is to reduce the transmit power of the access point. If I reduce down the power level, then obviously my signal's not going to go as far and my cell coverage will be less. Now the advantage of reducing down the transmit power level is that it reduces down my co-channel interference because now I'm not transmitting such a strong signal so it's not going to interfere as much with that access point that's operating on the same channel. 
Of course, the disadvantage is that I've reduced down the power level, so the areas where you can get the higher data rates is reduced, so my overall cell capacity is reduced as well. So again, two different approaches for how you can reduce your cell size if you have a high-density wireless LAN deployment. So the third survey model that I want to take you through is the one for voice over wireless LANs. Now, why is voice different? Voice is different because it's real time. So voice communications is very sensitive to any lost packets and any packets that are delayed. If a packet is actually delayed in transmission, what will happen is that the receiving application just won't play it. And so lost packets and delayed packets leave to gaps in the voice and therefore a very poor quality voice call. So when you're planning out your wireless network, you want to ensure that it's a high available wireless network. And what does that mean? Well, Cisco's made several recommendations, which I want to take you through on this slide, that directly relates to the deployment of the Cisco IP phones. So the first thing they recommend is that the cell overlap should be 20%. So remember when we were talking about data, it was 10 to 15%. Well, now they're talking about 20% in the 2.4 gigahertz band, and it's actually 15 to 20% in the 5 gigahertz band. Now, the reason why you want overlapping coverage is as you're making that voice call and you start to move towards the edge of the cell, you want to make sure that there's good overlap there so that as you need to hand over to the other access point that you're already in good range of that access point and so the potential of not being able to communicate, not being able to support the higher data rates has been removed by making sure the overlapping coverage is there. Why do you need more in the 2.4 than the 5 gigahertz? Well, because the 2.4 gigahertz band tends to be more crowded. There's more devices operating in that band, and there may be other wireless LANs. It could be other devices like Bluetooth or cordless phones that also operate in that band. So with the assumption that the 5 gigahertz band is a little bit cleaner in terms of spectrum, then you can get away with a 15 to 20% cell overlap. So in addition to looking at cell overlap, you've also got to look at the signal strength at the cell boundary. And Cisco is recommending that for the Cisco IP phones that the receive signal strength of minus 67 dBm. What that means is that you're doing your cell coverage planning where the signals drop to minus 67, that really creates the edge of the cell boundary. So even though you could go further away and perhaps connect with a laptop, a data-only device, the quality won't be good enough for a voice call. So minus 67 really defines the edge of the cell boundary if you're implementing Cisco IP phones. Now, if you're implementing a different type of IP phone, for instance, the Facera badge, those are those badges that you wear on you, then the required signal strength at the edge of the cell boundary is actually minus 65 dBm. So it's even a tighter requirement, and the cell coverage would...